And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who were lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them, told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Uh, well, we are in desperate need of good news, aren't we? And yet, this week, on Thursday, I was just walking out of the house with my wife, Anne, and uh, our neighbor, John, just pulled up in his uh, vehicle, and he got out of the car, and he was obviously full of something and very keen to, uh, to speak to us. And uh, he said, oh, I've just been down to Cheam, and I've had my first vaccine. And uh, he was told us all of how you have to go in and where you go and what happens to you and how they just keep you a little while afterwards. And uh, he was absolutely full of it. So whereas many of us are very disappointed now and suffering from very bad news, he was full of the joys of vaccine. Now, um, I was pleased for him, of course, um, but... I felt a little bit out of it because unless I go and tie up an old person in Cheam, steal their identity, and go off to non such mansion, I can't get the vaccine. And so what I have to share with you from the Bible today, I am really excited about because there are no limits on what Jesus has to offer and uh, the well, what's called salvation that he came to bring to this world, not just from COVID-19, but from what the Bible calls sin, which leads to death. In our readings uh, of, from the Christmas story, there was a common theme. So there was the uh, news of the shepherds, to, uh, news of the angels to the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. And in Matthew's account of the angel's visit to Joseph, you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Do you need saving? There was that uh, great quote in Titanic, wasn't there, where Rose, looking back at the end of her life, says, He, Jack, saved me in every way a person can be saved. Now, I don't know about you. I mean, I may be missing something here. As far as I can see, Jack did save her from two things. Number one, from marriage to an insufferable toff. And number two, from drowning in an icy sea. Well, fair dues, that, that's two ways in which he saved her. But is that every way a person can be saved? Two weeks ago, the pastor of Hope Church, Bridge End, although they're not formally connected to us, they have the same name, Bridge End in South Wales, died. He was just 63. His name was uh, Colonel Robbie Hall, and he received the Queen's Gallantry Medal in 1986 when his life changed dramatically. He was 30 years old. 
He was an army bomb disposal expert when a 500 kilogram World War II bomb was discovered at the base of Gas Holder 4 at the Beckton Gas Works. It was uh, buried entrenched in the mud, and uh, if it had gone off, it would have caused something a bit like the Beirut explosion uh, of uh, that uh, fertilizer which went up and took out uh, a good part of uh, Beirut. They couldn't uh, uh, just re release the gas without killing all life in the Thames. And Robbie, being an expert, was sent to investigate. When he got there, he heard that the bomb was hissing. It was in an unstable condition, and its nose was wedged in Thames mud. At his first dive, his breathing apparatus malfunctioned, and he got a mouthful and a lungful of noxious flurry. And looking back, he said this, close to panic, 10 meters below the surface, and conscious that my colleagues at the surface were blissfully aware of any crisis I found myself in, I prayed to a God I had never previously acknowledged. The other thing he knew he needed to do was to regurgitate everything he had swallowed fast. And he was trained to do so, and uh, he did. Well, he had to go down a few more times and working just by touch in the absolute darkness and alone face down in the Thames mud, he managed to diffuse the device and then it could be removed up through the middle of the gas holder to safety. And he was awarded the Queen's Gallantry Medal. But he didn't forget his prayer. This next posting was to the Falkland Islands and there he joined a Bible study group and he put his faith in Jesus Christ to save him eternally. I think he could say, he, Jesus, saved me in every way a person can be saved. So we have this name which is given by God through the angel to the baby. Matthew 1 verse 21. You will give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And in this verse, we see who he is and what he does. Who he is. He is God's baby. God's baby, Jesus. Now, Joseph and Mary looked like the perfect couple. He was kind, he had a trade, he was hardworking. She was the lovely, God-fearing girl next door. They got engaged uh, in their culture. They didn't sleep together before their wedding. Matthew tells us this twice at the beginning of the a little paragraph and at the end. And then Joseph's world was smashed to a million pieces. Mary started to show. And Mary, uh, Joseph wasn't really into uh, revenge. He didn't know what to do. And then he got the visit from the angel. Verse 20, but after he'd considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And Joseph is told to give the baby this name, Jesus. Now, if it's your baby, of course, you give the name, you decide the name. Even if that baby is a kitten or a salamander, if it's yours, you give it its name. And it's a big privilege and a responsibility. And there are websites to help you do this. So I was looking at one yesterday. 150 cute and clever names for your pet lizard. Gives you the help. Name your pet salamander. Rather strangely, I thought they didn't have the name Mandy there, which I would have thought was the obvious name for a pet salamander, but there you go. 
But Jesus is named by God because God is Jesus' father. Joseph knows he's not his baby, he's God's baby. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, we have the same theme. The angels there to the shepherds say, do not be afraid. <laughs> now, so many people, when they hear the good news, the, the Christian good news, the gospel, they, they freak out. And uh, they become afraid. And they think, oh, no, there's no way... Uh, I, I, I want to become a Christian, be a religious weirdo, some Bible basher, lose control of my life, wear dad jeans. I, I don't know all the things that Christians do. But no, this is good news. A Savior has been born to you. Actually, the really scary thing, I think, is to have to live life all by yourself, all on your own, fighting all of your own battles, looking to be your own savior, your own guide. That would be, to me, really, really scary. I'm just so relieved that I've asked Jesus to be my savior. And the title of this baby Good news, a Savior who is born to you is Christ the Lord, the Old Testament title for God. Jesus is God and God's baby. Now, all the way through the Hebrew Scriptures, we see that salvation is coming. Isaiah 51 verse 5, my salvation is on the way. And we see that someone is coming to save. Isaiah 35, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will save you. So the person who is coming to save is no less than God himself. Like uh, the angel goes on to say here to Joseph, uh, quoting Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 4. Uh, you will give him the name, or his name will be M with Anu Us L, Emmanuel, God with us, literally the with us God. Jesus is God with us and God to the rescue. So that's who he is, God to the rescue. What he does, well, he saves. And Joseph is told whom he saves, his people, and he's told what he saves his people from, their sins. That's what we really need to be saved from. Now, obviously there are a lot of problems. I mean, See if you agree with these statements. You don't have to put your hand up or anything, just sort of mentally assent or dissent from them. Okay, statement number one. There are problems in the world today. I think that's true. Number two. There are problems in the United Kingdom today. Number three. There are problems in my workplace or my school or my college today. Number four, there are problems in my family today. Number five, there are problems in my life today. Do you agree with those statements? What's behind all these problems? What's behind all the anger? that we see, say, on social media? What's behind all the fallings out? Seem to be everywhere. What's behind all the inequality? Tony Cascarino now writes for the Times on football, but he was an Irish football international, very articulate man. His life began to fall apart. And he identified the problem as what he called the me disease, the disease of 
me. Well, the Bible calls what Tony Cascarino calls the disease of me, sin and sins. Now, sometimes um, we realize that we're just not the people we should be. Sometimes that's, I think, through uh, annoyances. And then this week I got really annoyed um, with British Gas. I was uh, three hours on their so-called helpline talking to a bot called Cosmo. Uh, three times I spoke to him. He was no help at all. And then he put me in a queue. I think the highest position in the queue I was in was number 88, and I sort of worked down um, over the hours. And then eventually I got to a proper human agent. But as soon as they asked me a question that they couldn't answer, they just cut me off. And then I was back to Cosmo again. I, I gather, by the way, that if you take a pickaxe to your gas supply, the response is a little bit quicker than that. Not sure I recommend that, but it is one way. But there were other people who annoyed me as well this week. And I realized the reason they were annoying me, I was getting annoyed, was because of my ego. I felt taken for granted. I felt as though I was being unrecognized, ignored. Someone has sort of said, a little bit embellished, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator if our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent a scientist. If our greatest need had been health, he would have sent us a vaccine developer. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us a quantitative visa. But since our greatest need was forgiveness, God sent us a savior. And there are two aspects of sin which we all need saving from. Sin debt and the sin habit. And first of all, Jesus as our Savior canceled the sin debt. Now, a lot uh, this year has been spoken about cancel culture. So the idea is that some very uh, bad people in the past who um, were racist or oppressive, and um, we don't really want to remember them anymore, so we're going to try to erase them from history, to cancel them. Well, God could have done that with all of us, quite frankly. He could have said, right, those human beings, they're just a lot of trouble. They just do a lot of uh, bad things. So I'm going to cancel them. But God didn't actually do that. He canceled something else instead. Hebrews uh, chapter 2 says that Jesus canceled the record of the legal charge that was against us. Hebrews 2, um, uh, and uh, he says, in doing this, he forgave all of our sin. Rather than cancel us. God decided to cancel our sin, to cancel our charges against us, to cancel our condemnation. And he did that when Jesus, his son, died for us in our place for our sins on the cross. He canceled our charge sheet. He canceled our sin debt. And secondly, he cancelled or broke our sin habit. The Bible tells us that not only do we have a guilty record, but sin is also an addiction. Jesus said, John chapter 8, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And that's the other great thing that Jesus does. He sets us free from ourselves, from our sins. Charles Wesley put it, he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. And although as Christians we continue to 
to sin. We do commit sin still. We are happiest when we are at peace with our Father God. We realize that it's our sins that killed the Son of God, and we really want to be shot of them, and bit by bit, God deals with them. I remember um, an ordinary working bloke, rather like Joseph, called Bob Redhead. He was uh, a roofer. He became uh, a Christian when uh, I was in Worthing. And about a year after, he fell off a ladder and broke multiple bones in his body. And he spent about five weeks in Worthing Hospital. And so as his pastor, I went to see him. And he showed me a list on a screen bit of scrap-lined paper, which he'd written with thick pencil. And it was all in capital letters. And it went a bit like this. Some of this was actually what he said. Some of it I, I can't quite remember now. But he said, changes to my life. Number one, I do not blaspheme. Number two, I do not shout at my wife. Number three, I do not make up work for my customers. Number four, I do not hate blacks. Number five, I do not swear or make gestures at motorists. And uh, after this list of changes to his life, he'd written these words, and I do remember these. The Son of God gave his life for me for 46 years. I never knew that. And when he knew that the Son of God had given his life for him, Bob Redhead, there were a whole pile of changes in his life. Well, the vaccine is being rolled out, but you still need to go and get the jab at some point if you're going to get protection. In the same way, Jesus Christ has gone to the cross, but you still need to go to the cross of Jesus to receive this forgiveness. You need to trust him that he gave his life for you. For many people, it takes a crisis a bit like Colonel Robbie Hall because for most of us, we live with our faults for most of the time until the sin hits the fan and then there's a crisis in our lives or in our relationships. You don't have to wait for a crisis, but maybe you're going through one now. And this is the perfect time. In a way, we are all going through a crisis now, aren't we? We're not in control of our lives. But the one great thing that can never be stopped is the birth of Jesus into this world, Christmas. The death of Jesus for the sins of his people, the cross. And you can go to Jesus and he will tell you, nobody will ever love you like me. Nobody will ever give their life for you like me. Nobody will ever offer you forgiveness like me. Nobody will ever save you from your sins like me. Come to me. Receive the forgiveness that I won for you on the cross. And then you can be one of my people. The people I was born that first Christmas for, when I was given the human name Jesus, you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. And if you trust him, he will save you from your sin. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the first Christmas. We thank you that many people's lives have been totally transformed ever since. Lord Jesus, please save me from my sins. Lord, maybe my sins have come to a bit of a head. And it is time for a reset. And Lord, thank you that you have come into my life. That you are the one that really I'm beginning to hope in and looking to and trusting and getting excited about. And so thank you, Jesus, for coming to this world for me. Please forgive me. Please help me. 
to live my life through easy and the hard times because I do need your help. I cannot live my life alone. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.